Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, if you can go ahead and just put in the chat where are you dialing in from today, that'd be great. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Daniela Barbosa. I'm the Vice President of Worldwide Alliances at the Linux Foundation with the Hyperledger Project. Um, for the last four years, I've had the honor and the privilege of working with our Hyperledger community uh, worldwide as we build um, uh, this global community up. Um, I'm delighted today to be hosting this conversation on blockchain and how it's shaping the future economy with these amazing group of women. Uh, we're going to learn a lot today from each other and there'll be plenty of time for questions. And I encourage you to ask them as we go along. Uh, you could put them in the chat or in the Q&A, in the Zoom Q&A area. We'll take a look at those. We'll address them. We'll e either weave them through the discussion or we'll just uh, uh, address them at, at the end of the discussion. Uh, before we do get started today, once again, welcome everyone. Um, I do want to take a couple of seconds to acknowledge that uh, we are still in the middle of a pandemic around the world. Um, the last 15 months has been very difficult for all of us. Uh, certainly, there's no doubt about it. Uh, with close to 3.2 million deaths around the world and with the recent horrific number of cases in countries like Brazil and India, Sometimes it's hard to phantom how we just keep going on and you know having these meetings and having business discussions. Um, but we do this because we are resilient and the majority of us in the blockchain community know that a lot of the work that we've been working on for many, many years is really part of the future that we wanna build that will hopefully um, not allow pandemics and issues like this occur again. And quite honestly, we have to build it. We have to build it for ourselves. We have to build it for our children. We have to build it for one another. So I wanna just take a couple of seconds. I want us all, um, especially with our audience, our global audience, and many of you in India the, uh, t this morning, to just take a deep breath and think about our sisters, our brothers, our aunties, our parents, our grandparents, all our friends who have families that are currently struggling with COVID in regions. And just keep in mind that together, we are stronger. So just a couple of seconds, deep breath. Thank you. Let's keep that in mind as we go through this. Um, today's panelists, as I was looking at everybody's background and kind of their, their careers, um, we have close to a hundred years of experience combined in business, educations, working in standard bodies and government and finance. And our combined experiences are really well suited for today's discussion on how blockchain and distributed ledger technologies will shape the future of a global economy to one that is equal, fair and open to all and why women will play a leading role in this future. We're already seeing that quite a bit. So I wanna introduce you to the panelists. I'm gonna do that alphabetically by surname, um, and then we will go to video and kind of see each other's here. Okay. So um, alphabetically, we'll start with Alex. Um, Alex Albano is the Chief Growth Officer at Chainstack for Blockchain Managed Services, which is a leader in the market. Um, she's a founder of the blockchain consultancy Achana Labs. Um, Alex has previously been the CEO of Space Chain, which is kind of cool, and was part of the team that made the installation of the Bitcoin node on the International Space Station. Uh, we certainly know that space will be a very important part of the future global economy. I have no doubt about it, and maybe that will come up in our discussions today. Um, she's also a founding member of the Ocean Protocol, a decentralized data exchange, and she is dialing in from Singapore today, correct? Awesome. Welcome, Alex. Uh, next, we have Raji Igvagar. She's the managing director for India and South Asia for DTL, uh, uh, DLT Ledgers, which is a Singapore-based Singapore, a Singapore -based fintech blockchain company as well. Uh, she uh, has uh, over 33 years of experience working with global customers in sales, marketing alliances, and ecosystem development. Uh, Raji is not only evangelizes, but also endorses blockchain as a philosophy of life apart from technology. Um, and we hope that we will talk about that today. Um, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts on the importance of governance and what I, many call co opetition in the space and why that's so important in a decentralized um, tech from uh, the decentralized technology. Uh, next, we have Leanne Kemp, uh, CEO and founder of Everledger, a Q adjunct professor of future industries from 2018 to 2020. She was the Queensland chief 
entrepreneur, which is an amazing role in the work that she did there. Uh, she's also part of the World Economics Global Future Council on Manufacturing and Blockchain. Um, Everledger is best known for building ethical and transparent supply chains, including what I usually describe as a girl's best blockchain which is the diamond industry. Um, and she advocates building a circular economy, which many believe is the key to the future global economy that we are going to be discussing today. Uh, Leanne believes that companies should understand that they themselves are major stakeholders in our common future. It's not just the participants and the consumers and, and us people, but the companies themselves. Um, and by being stakeholders in our common future, they must work with other stakeholders to improve the state of the world in which they are operating. I think the three introductions so far, we can see that there's a human element to what we're building in this future economy that's so important. Uh, next, we have Kristen uh, Pomas Langerberger if I said that correctly. Um, she's a community strategist in blockchain uh, based out of Tampa, Florida, where I'm in San Francisco. I forgot to mention this, where it's 11 o'clock at night. And I was like, oh, it's late, but it's 2 a.m. in the morning. So fantastic. And thank you so much for joining us. She's also the vice chair of the IEEE P2145 Working Group on Blockchain DLT Governance Standards. Um, she's managing director of Coalitions Consulting, a firm that specializes in the human components of blockchain blockchain systems, governance, trust, and stakeholder commitment. So um, obviously her experience is going to be very valuable in our discussions, um, certainly with human elements uh, in distributed technology. And, you know, I'm here to say it's not just the tech and bros in the back that are doing things with the tech and that it all runs by itself. We uh, hopefully will get to that as well. Um, and last but not least, we got Chilla Zavari who is VP of Marketing and Strategy at Blockchain Technology Partners. Um, in the past, she was a senior research analyst for Blockchain DLT at 451 Research, s and Global Market Intelligence. If anyone has the pulse on what is happening in the marketplace, Chilla is certainly one of those people in the uh, panel today, uh, digging into the solutions in the markets and the players. Um, she really has an inside view of blockchain and DLT technology um, and how that will shape the future of global economy. So once again, welcome everyone. I'm delighted to host this discussion today um, and let's go ahead and get started. We'll start uh, as with the, at the end of the alphabet, Chilla, Chilla you're up first. Um, and I, I bet you were always called last in class. So I decided to call you first today. Um, and go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about what you're working on now that is relevant to our discussion um, around the future economy and what really made you go down the path of blockchain and decentralized technologies? Yes, yeah, so I don't, maybe perhaps something interesting is how my, my first professional encounter with technology overall, it was sort of accidental. And I was actually thrown in at the deep end. I, I found myself, I mean, I, my background, I'm an economist. I, that's what I studied. And I have a master's in uh, business and management consulting. And, uh, you know, as uh, I was put into the world of IT research and innovation without knowing anything about technology. So I, I, had, to, I had to pick that up. Right. Uh, and then with, with blockchain, I, I, I formally met blockchain, let's say that in early 2017. Uh, I was a technology industry analyst back then already. And um, I was in a team uh, that was covering cloud transformation. But the good thing was that we had some liberty to look at various areas of digital innovation. So I started, I know blockchain technology caught my attention. I really liked the fact that it was like so many areas come. It wasn't just about technology, like different areas were coming together, like legal, business, and um, things like that. So it really caught my attention and I, I started to read about it a lot. And then I started to write reports. And, uh, you know, a few months later, I, I, I became officially a, a blockchain analyst. And I was that for, for a few years. And now uh, earlier this year, I joined the startup world. I joined uh, Blockchain Technology Partners. It's uh, an enterprise blockchain startup based out of uh, Edinburgh. I'm, I'm in Barcelona. And uh, I'm the VP of marketing and strategy. And, but you know, in a startup, you always do a lot of different things, right? And one thing that you asked that, what am I working right now? Uh, so we just recently launched a DLT, um, uh, so-called DLT landscape, which is an open source initiative 
which is sort of we are trying to you know make sense of all the confusion with you know with the with the vendor landscape in DLT has become so complex like so many projects out there so many companies innovating in in very different areas that are related but still have created uh, a landscape that it's it's it, it, it got really really complex. So we are trying to make sense of that with this initiative. It's open source. Please, you know, if you have time, just check it out. Check it out. It's uh, dltlandscape.org. So that's me. Well, defining and you know having set standards that you can look towards, right? That you understand is a primary, you know, a primary thing in building these networks. So um, thank you for for that work that you're doing, um, Kirsten. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what you're working on that's relevant to the discussion today and, you know, what make you, what, what got you here? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I am the vice chair of IEEE P2145, um, the IEEE's blockchain governance working group. We are a group of about 200 plus individuals from all over the world developing open source standards um, for the governance of public and private blockchain ecosystems. Um, uh, in addition to that, I, a, I also consult um, blockchain companies um, on the human side of blockchain ecosystems, which is uh, an area that I'm very, very passionate about um, and ties into how I got into the space. Um, so I have um, worked in a bunch of different software startups and uh, in 2018, 2019, I was working on a data aggregation um, tech startup that um, ended up having me cross paths with um, the Ethereum space. I had been aware of things like cryptocurrencies for a while prior, but hadn't given them too much thought until I realized what blockchain technology could do for multi-stakeholder data transfer um, and trusted data transfer. And that took me down the rabbit hole and um, I started to volunteer in the space and try to find any way possible to get more involved. And um, that was about three years ago now. And I, I've been nose down in the space ever since. Um, there are many reasons why I, I think that the space is the coolest place to be right now. But I would say off the top of my head, um, it's truly global. Um, and this event right now is a testament to that. I've had so many awesome opportunities to collaborate with people from all over the world um, on various projects because this is distributed technology. It's global distributed technology. Um, and um, in addition to that, I just think blockchain technology has so much infinite value to provide um, to countless, um, countless industries out there. Any industry where there are multiple stakeholders that are engaging in some sort of relationship um, that you know, necessitates trust and necessitates trade of information, blockchain is going to be a major innovation point in the coming decades. So happy to be here. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Leanne, if you can uh, tell us a little bit about the work that you're working on that's relevant to the discussion today and uh, how'd you get here? <laughs> <laughs> I often ask myself that question, how did I get here? But um, most importantly, the question we asked was, uh, where did it come from? Which, of course, was the nexus point or the inflection point to build Everledger. So hi to everyone from India, particularly in the diamond industry, Surat, Mumbai, Bangalore, uh, Jaipur. You know, there's no secrets about where Everledger started. We started... Um, providing for a system of origin and traceability in chain of custody for what is largely some of the most opaque supply chains in the world. Beginning with diamonds and coloured gemstones and then further afield today, we also looked at what industries potentially could be most um, conflicted by 2030 and 2050. And um, parts of our work moving forward was to not only think about how can we make an entirely new economic structure like circular economy stick, but also how do we prevent um, a blood dry diamond atrocity in another industry? And of course that's stored energy in batteries. And a lot of that work we began in 2016 on the tail end um, of the World Economic Forum's positioning around the Global Battery Alliance. And so Everledger does everything from traceability of um, diamonds and gemstones right up into the luxury brands with Alexander McQueen and Web3 and all those fantastic things that are pretty bullish in the market right now. But primarily, we think about how can we bring um, a system of 
trade and rails, digital rails, to support uh, an ethical platform. And uh, that's where we started and that's where we'll end. Leanne, can you ex- can you define circular economy? Maybe you know some of the uh, uh, audience hasn't uh, heard that term before. Yeah, when we think about the current ways that we make things and we either dispose of them, we dig a hole and we throw it in the bin, um, or we consume it, and there's a significant amount of waste involved in manufacturing. There's a construct that has been born to really think about not just only reusing and recycling and repurposing. But how do we enable or view waste as value? Um, And some of that isn't just necessarily seen within one supply chain, but it's linking different supply chains together. So some work that was embarked upon in 2017, a couple of years after Everledger started, was to think about could Apple or Dell or even IBM become a supplier to the diamond and jewellery industry? Um, many people thought I was a bit mad. They often do. But the reality is it's true. You know, there is a significant amount of cr- critical metals and minerals that are used in electronics that are often discarded and wasted. And so how can we combine different supply chains together to make entirely new products or how do we stop digging up the planet and so the circular economy is that principle to move from what we once knew um, was just a linear economy so we take it we make it and we dispose it to how do we reuse recycle and repurpose wonderful thank you uh raji let me see yep remove spotlight there you go Raji, are you on? There you go. Uh, you're muted. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Excellent. Hi, everyone. Thank you. This is wonderful and really great to see these panelists here and hearing all these wonderful uh, experiences that people have had. So, yeah, quickly, my name is Raji Anger, and uh, as uh, I was introduced, I've been in the IT industry for over 33 years with large MNCs, uh, both in India as well as Singapore. Uh, and 33 years is a long time. It's uh, literally time to retire now and hang up my boots. Uh, well, I almost did that twice. Uh, but what got me into this uh, blockchain part was obviously the interest uh, and, uh, and the greatness of the platform. Uh, so, yeah, that's how I got into it. And I strongly believe that, you know, from all that you've heard so far, uh, I think, uh, and as, I, as you mentioned in the introduction too, I think blockchain is... Uh, almost a way of life is more a philosophy than technology. Uh, we are talking of authenticity, we'll be talking of transparency, we'll be talking of visibility, uh, immutability of records and consensus base, etc. Now, isn't that way of life? That's how we should lead our life, right? So, uh, frankly, that uh, definitely is more uh, that than actual technology. But anyway, coming back to what I do, so I am based out of Mumbai currently. I am with uh, DLT Ledgers. It's a Singapore-based uh, based startup. Uh, it's a startup that was uh, uh, just set up about three, four years ago, but we've done some amazing work. Uh, it's a private permissioned uh, network for clients. Uh, the underpinning technology, of course, being blockchain. Uh, it's... Uh, and we work with the large enterprise, the banks and the SMEs. And as we talk today, I'll share with you in detail as to what we do with them. But clearly one of the use cases that has come up very strongly and uh, stood out in the pandemic is the challenges we face uh, in the cross-border trade. Trade per se is complex, as we all know, there's movement of goods with documents and contracts and you know, exchange of money, et cetera. And now given the pandemic and when it's cross-border, it becomes even more complex. So where does blockchain come in and how do we fit in and what are the kind of uh, opportunities and use cases we should be looking at would be the interesting discussion that we're going to have today. Just one or two use cases, which is which would be of interest to the audience is also in uh, fraud detection when it comes to bank loans and things like that. So I will talk about that as well uh, today if we do get an opportunity. And of course, supply chain visibility, which is uh, huge. So a lot of uh, use cases, but we'll go one by one. Yeah, yeah you know, w- w- one of the things that um, your many years of experience around building ecosystems and alliances um, is so important to have those skill set and, you know, someone like yourself to have those skill set in order to build these 
blockchain networks and these governance models. Um, you know, I always joke that um, you don't get rid of the lawyers, you don't get rid of the humans, and you don't get rid of the lawyers, no matter how much technology you throw at it. Um, so, um, tell us a little bit about the the kind of the the parallels that you've seen in building these ecosystems. You know, probably in hand to hand combat with you know competition very often um, to what you're seeing in, you know, this, you know, with your startup now with the DLT ledgers and building these governance networks? What's, what's the key thing that pops in your mind when you, when you think about that? Sure. Uh, as you mentioned, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a world of cooperation, uh, frankly. I don't think we should consider it as competition anymore uh, because, uh, Daniela, this is no longer the world of exclusivity anymore. Uh, many years ago, when I started to build alliances with large MNCs, it was, you know, you're either an infrastructure player or a software player. And then, you know, you sort of come together and see how you can go to market, giving, you know, each of them coming together and seeing what they can do for the customer's uh, benefit. But as we went along, came along cloud and many other solutions, which doesn't clearly, there are no clear team market areas that this is where I play and this is where I don't play. So competition slowly became cooperation, and uh, I think uh, it's important that we recognize that, acknowledge that, and try and work together. I strongly believe that the sustainability of any marketplace is to work with partners, work with cooperation, and see at the end of the day what translates as an advantage to the end customer. That is so important. Uh, and you know, we will get better at it when we recognize each other's strength and leverage on the strength to, to build that, uh, you know, to build that uh, advantage for the customer. Right. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how the technology enables that. Yes, right? yes, and absolutely. Like and we'll come back to how it's working in today's world in blockchain, where you do see competition, which is not really competition, and how do we leverage that? We'll come mm -hmm. to that, yeah. Excellent. Alex. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's brilliant to be part of this amazing conversation. <laughs> Yeah, so if you had to picture me, just really picture me with drill as a drills and spanner girl, as far as blockchain goes, uh, as I take care of infrastructure, it's literally like the piping and the wiring uh, here at Chainstack. Um, you know, the it, blockchain has enormous potential as a technology, but eventually it comes down to nodes. <laughs> Can you run the nodes? How many nodes and how are these uh, nodes resilient and who is having control over them? Uh, there is you know, a whole conversation uh, around centralization by stealth just because of the infrastructure um, and how it's been set up. So that's a, that's a mission here. As a, as a chief growth officer at Chainstack, I'm looking at providing um, the best possible uh, infrastructure for all sorts of projects that are just now out there. So uh, from enterprise blockchain all the way to uh, Web3, and we've seen exponential growth in both areas. Um, and you know, it's it's fascinating to see. I've been in the industry since 2017, and I will join the the <laughs> the the strike uh, of people saying that they've joined by accident. Here I am again. My actual training is in is in an artistic field. Uh, I trained as a concert pianist. That was my my, my, my first career. So uh, first message to everyone out there is really like, don't put barrier on yourself. You don't need an engineering degree. Uh, you can build up your, your competence and if there is passion, then everything you know can, can come. So I, I got by accident because I saw so many books lying around. It's been like a family business by now. So our <laughs> dinner conversation are quite peculiar. I appreciate that, but it's also very rewarding. Um, as, as blockchain, they, they say, I, I lived in London for many, for actually a good portion of my adult life. And we used to say, if you're tired of London, you're tired of life. I think the, the same goes with blockchain. If you, if you get tired of the industry, then really, you know, you're tired of life because there is always, you know, it's, a, it's just the beginning of an industry. So I started as uh, um, uh, with Ocean Protocol. So there was infrastructure in the sense of data, data as, you know, fuel for everything that goes on in terms of applications and so on. And then moved to chain to Space Chain, which has been this crazy, crazy stint at, uh, in, within the aerospace industry. There is a lot actually that is happening in the space industry 
And the bet that the team of Space Chain did was on bringing decentralization on the governance of satellites. So um, I worked together with them on setting up. And that was a like, hugely fascinating project, both from a governance point of view and from a technical point of view. Of course, you know, the, the technical limitations of space in terms of storage and the quality also of the uh, transmissions and um, and latency can be of hindrance or can be a strength. So it was about leveraging that and building an entire decentralized network of satellites for data sharing primarily. So, you know, hugely fascinating, very, very privileged. And also to have been, you know, at NASA and being part of the team that, uh, you know, facilitated together with the SpaceX teams on the installations of the Bitcoin node on the International Space Station. International Space Station. And after that, uh, yeah, it's been Chainstack as well as my uh, consulting company called Acha Labs. And with both of them, uh, you know, it's a it's a journey on seeing the, how the blockchain industry is growing and how I, you know I can try and facilitate that uh, both from a you know a, a, like a technical point of view and from a business point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I'd like to pull the threads a little bit on this. You know, what you need operationally to become you know, part of a global economy in these new systems. Um, so you know, Alex talked a little bit about sort of the managed services that you're you know, providing um, so that you know, companies can come to you and say, I want to join this network. I don't have the infrastructure. I don't have the, even the administrators and the skilled people in, in my companies in, to run these nodes and to administer these nodes. Um, maybe others in the, in, the audience, in the audience, in the panel, can talk a little bit about kind of what what is it that the, the the what are the current skills and requirements that both the companies and individuals need to have to be able to participate um, you know and participate at an equal level uh, with everybody else because you know one of the things that's important is um, is having you know everybody come in at the same at the same level whether you're a very large company or small company so um, anybody else maybe have some examples from work that they've done about you know how do you how do you level set people coming into these networks yeah so um many of the projects specifically on the enterprise side of things um that i've come across that i've worked with have actually had specifically node hosting be a barrier for um, businesses that are being onboarded to their network so much to the, the extent that oftentimes they desire to outsource node hosting um, or the company that's building the blockchain um, solution ends up providing um, node hosting on behalf of them as a part of the service. So of course, from a technical perspective, having the service provider uh, hosting all of the nodes for all the clients is definitely not optimal. Um, we know that in order for blockchains to be secure, there has to be that decentralized peer-to-peer -peer, um, maintaining of the nodes. Um, but I, I would say just because the, the industry is still so nascent, um, it is definitely a, a big barrier. And I'm actually very curious to see um, from the other panelists what are some ways that they've helped uh, companies get around uh, the barrier of figuring out the technical side of interacting with blockchain systems and maintaining the nodes. Yeah, actually that's uh, right. So it, blockchain, when you look at it from a technology point of view, so to many others may seem very complex, right? But if we come up from the technology level to the business level and how do we adopt this technology from, uh, uh, you know, from an adoption point of view, from a use case point of view, it becomes simpler. So for clients, like for example, when I talk about cross-border trade, and as I mentioned earlier, today if you look at, you know, how do you keep the wheels of trade moving? Let me take a simple example of, uh, you know, current situation of the pandemic and the vaccines and the disruption in the value, you know, in the supply chain, et cetera, right? So when you're talking of any kind of a cross-border uh, interaction with different jurisdictions coming into play, here's the scenario, and imagine this, that you are, moving goods from one place to the other with the different, uh, you know, like governments coming into play and different parties coming into play. If I take a simple trade, it's the trader, there's a buyer, there's a seller, a buyer's bank, seller's bank, logistics guys, uh, you know, the customs guys, the insurance, etc. So a whole lot of people are there in this one simple 
right? If you look at a value chain. So, uh, if, so if I demystify this, uh, what we do, for example, is we build this pipe. We, the pipe is already built and handed over to the client. And this is a SaaS-based thing. It is on cloud, Azure. It can be on any cloud. Currently, it's on Microsoft Azure. It literally takes just 48 hours for somebody to sign in and come on to it. And as far as the other nodes are concerned, uh, you know, we try and on both the counterparties, again, based on the node side. The biggest thing I find is, you know, if you lower that uh, apprehensiveness uh, from an end user point of view and see how this can be adopted, it's a simpler journey to get onto. It is a journey. Blockchain is a journey. We need to sort of get onto it slowly and then see where the adoption can take us. Mm -hmm. uh, just trying to demystify the technical part. I don't want people to think that it's too complex and, you know, should I or should I get on? Yeah. Can I can I add on to that to say yeah. actually that the an entire industry is coming. A chain stack is part of you know blockchain managed services, but actually it's an entire industry that is coming to make life easier, like to professionalize also the services part to facilitate on from a usability point of view, from a scalability point of view, and also from an interoperability point of view. I think these are probably the three main areas the enterprises are looking to um, you know to to touch on when at least when when I speak to them. So when it comes to interoperability, it it, it used to to at the you know, beginning 2017, blockchain was this silver bullet that would destroy industries, right? Disruptively. Uh, instead we're seeing that is is an incremental innovation that is happening. And it is happening quite discreetly but surely. So that needs to fit in with what is not just the current infrastructure within enterprises, but also the mentality and the, the skill set. Of the of the teams that are there, so having a bridge that can speak the language of enterprises and can, can fit in with the current infrastructure is one. When it comes to scalability, I think that flexibility is the major major thing that um, can be a barrier. So many companies will have their own cloud, for example, or may have their own geographical limitation, for example, from a regulatory point of view in terms of compliance. So having the ability of deploying nodes and infrastructure within premises or within a specific like Azure for some could be Azure for other, sorry for AWS for others could be GCP and so on. So having that flexibility will really remove uh, quite a bit of barriers and then usability because not many teams will come, uh, probably Lian will have experience with some companies that will not have any experience in blockchain, same for, for you Rajis and, and for the others. Yeah. They, they don't have a blockchain teams, they don't have a DevOps teams that can understand blockchain. So how, how can we all as an industry facilitate that and make that happen? Yeah, and just adding to that usability piece is, you know, it's obviously a key requirement and continues to be a challenge, but not, not only for the business user, but the technical user as well, right? So both developers and sort of average user, business user are sort of struggling with that. So we, we as vendors need to provide all that, you know, proper tooling for developers, support services, integration into uh, that sort of familiar business and technical touch points that, you know, these people are, are used to, right? In, in order to for them to be comfortable with it and 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 sort of have a wider adoption of of of, of blockchain based uh, systems. Leanne, I'd love your opinion. You've been working with government agencies and regulators for <laughs> for many many years. Um, to the point of you know how how do you get a regulator or, you know or a government agency on board? Um, what's what's the hardest and easiest thing to do? <laughs> Well, the hardest thing to do is to define what's the role of government. And then once government can define their role um, in blockchain or blockchain uh, architecture or infrastructure or ecosystem, then I guess we can start to talk and speak to them. There's definitely the role of a regulator and policymakers when it comes to um, when it comes to blockchain and even cryptocurrency. You know, but I'll sort of wind back for five seconds. Like I began Everledge in 2014. Um, arguably, there really wasn't expert blockchain engineers in 2014 but I, I mean I'm an engineer myself so I've wrote the very first versioning of Everledger on my own laptop quietly in London and what I thought was I'm not going to be able to just go and grab you know 10 year experience blockchain engineers because they just didn't exist but what did exist was really great DevOps and good database engineers and incredible um, you know front end and back end developers and even full stacks that understood the leveling of languages 
Um, and so you can build a really great blockchain team, which is what we started to see in the early days from 2014 to 2017. And then those that are committed to the religion of blockchain and distributed technologies became incredibly well-positioned um, blockchain engineers. Um, but it was in the very first sort of year or two, I remember and we worked very closely with the Turing Institute, but I thought, wow, I've got to have a team of cryptographers in Everledger to be able to do this but not necessarily the case either, right? So there's a great rule if you're a software engineer and if you're a cryptographer, don't roll your own crypto. It's um, pretty dangerous. Uh, and from Australia's perspective, I held a government role. There's no secrets around that role. And part of the work here was to also align government into the understanding that this technology is not going away. Um, and it's as fundamental to economic policy as it is to innovation across the country. Um, and how do we position it across a roadmap that is more than just the next 10 years, but a commitment um, that, of course, would see um, bilateral support, regardless of who the government of the day is. Um, and largely, if we were to think about our economy in Australia and understood the importance of the internet in you know, the late 90s or the late 80s, how and where would Australia be positioned? Rather than seeing it as a tool, if we saw it as a fundamental fabric of trade or a fundamental fabric of communication, then where would we be differently? And I think that's a really important positioning of the importance of this technology, not just only with corporates, but also with government. But it's not really a well understood topic. So if you're trying to lobby into government, into politicians, it's pretty tough to get a minister to go all boots in on blockchain because it's, it's, um, it's volatile. It's still very uh, nascent. Uh, and so you're going to need a brave government to really step out in front. Mm -hmm. We still need to. And oh, even, I, yeah. um, we need, again, to put the uh, Bitcoin is not blockchain slide that we used to all start with all the time again, because it is, um, you know, uh, there is progress being made, right? And there's definitely progress being made at the university level, at the computer, you know, the computer science education levels as well. Um, even um, I have an 11 year old daughter and she takes some online schools at a thing called OutSchool and they have a blockchain 101 course for little kids. Um, so, you know, to man, to your point right you know you know 30 years ago people were like oh, what's the internet i don't care um now people actually have to care about distributed ledger technologies which are not new we all know that it's not new i just wanted to add to what leanne was saying from a government point of view and uh, the regulators as well uh, uh, daniela so in singapore we worked with the uh, monetary authority of singapore which is the regulatory board right from a bank's uh, perspective and uh, what we did with them was that along with them and uh, 14 other banks uh, came together to look at fraud detection. We call it trade registry. So we've had many cases uh, in many parts of the world where there's double financing going on and you know, banks losing a huge amount of money and uh, obviously there's no trust as well. So here the regulatory board, uh, regulatory bank, uh, monetary authority of Singapore came together with other banks and they used our platform to look at how do you, and there is AIML as well, uh, all part of blockchain then, uh, where they were able to detect, uh, you know, if a particular trade is being financed more than one time. So that was a very important uh, one where government stepped in. There is another one, uh, Trade Trust, where between Singapore government and Netherlands, they are coming to uh, Rotterdam, they're coming to, you know, agree that, uh, and this happened, this pilot happened uh, a couple of months ago where, uh, you know, we're trying to say that between two governments, how do you agree upon uh, trade of, uh, completely paperless and completely digitized uh, trade. So that's another move that's coming up. So yeah, technology is uh, just one element of it, but we need the governing bodies, we need uh, authorities, regulatory bodies to come together, work with the local communities and, you know. And, 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 and still the digital transformation needs to happen first. I mean, a lot, especially in trade finance and supply chain, a lot of the, you know, of the requirements still lie on just, you know, good old digital transformation that needs to happen, right? That the data needs to be made available uh, to these processes. Um, and that's a huge undertaking as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And into, you know, as uh, Leanne also mentioned, and uh, I think Alex mentioned this, touched upon this, is about the inter-enterprise uh, collaboration. Now, the inter-enterprise collaboration is going to be the next major growth area where blockchain is going to be absolutely blockchain. And the fact that it's a decentralized uh, distributed ledger is going to be the key. 
Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the skill set. You know, Alex uh, started with uh, saying that she came in from from the arts, from the arts world, um, into it. And Leanne is a coder, so she was coding blockchain applications on her laptop before. Um, um, what are what are the skill sets for those that are listening in the audience and for especially for women in technology or women who, you know, maybe not in technology, maybe they're working in policy, maybe they're working in education. What are the things that are really important as we think about the technology, the social impact, the social requirements, the trust factors? Um, I think uh, I don't know who was it that talked about trust before, but like what are the things from a skill set perspective that we should be looking at and hiring into organizations. And let me go first on this one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think first of all, like if there is a culture within the within the uh, company to um, hire for diversity, that should be of course a priority. <laughs> like there are, I don't know, like. Uh, if I had a penny for every time I had a call where I was the only woman there, I would be like invested so much in bitcoins already, <laughs> for sure. That's really that's really unfortunately still the case. It's very much so in in, uh, in blockchain as a whole, but um, for infrastructure and that that's a plea like coming to come to DevOps. <laughs> there is a lot there is a lot uh, happening and and it's quite stimulating. So you don't need to be an engineer for sure. Um, even if it's a it's a non technical role, you will still need to understand. The, the the you know at least the very basics of blockchain but you don't need to be a cryptographer to understand it like seriously you know it's just a question of having group with you know critical understanding of what you need to understand i know it's a bit of a you know double layer but everybody's true just you know go shop and read a lot um never be intimidated by white papers for example there is no like there are there are bits that are really hard like that escape for sure I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one there, but I'm pretty sure that many engineers are doing the same as well. <laughs> so, so some bits are really, really like good and difficult maths. And we are very grateful for those who, you know, who are building and they are developing that side. But blockchain is inter- interdisciplinary for sure. There are many fields that needs to come together. Personally, when if you're building a career in growth, uh, ecosystem growth, probably Daniela, you can also chime in on that for sure. But for definitely um, traditional marketing uh, is there, but it's not enough. Like you need to understand what is the actual community like. So open source communities and you know learning and developing your skill set on on that specifically is a very different different skill set. So that's for sure needs to go there. Growth hacking as a whole, you'd need to be very open-minded on how you are, you're going to you know find your audiences and your leads. Uh, that's for sure if you are a startup and you know you have very limited budget and you still need to do and then grow in, in such an exciting market. And then um, you can pick from game theory, even there, like you can go complex, you can be, you know, mathematician and still have questions about it for sure. Or you can, you know, be humble and just, you know, find your limitations of what you can or cannot understand and push the boundaries, even if it sometimes is painful, you know, say, I don't understand it. <laughs> That's never pleasant, right? Or I don't get it. It's also not pleasant, but doesn't matter, right? You just go and push for what you can do. Um, I would say also personally, I find behavioral economics as a whole, as a field, extremely, extremely relevant to building and growing ecosystems in blockchain. Because I think if that's one thing that crypto has shown to the world is that we are irrational beings and we cannot control, we cannot plan. <laughs> so that that's, you know, let, let's embrace that and, and let's make a system uh, around it with behavioral economics. Um, and then, you know, of course, even understanding the basics of the infrastructure and how the piping works, that's also understandable never be intimidated, just ask questions and that there should be enough. Yeah, I would also say the same, uh, the matter what you said, the Alex, uh, don't get intimidated by this. And incidentally, so just to add to what you said, we were all thrown into this, uh, you know, by accident. So a bit about me. So I was into astronomy and astrophysics 33 years back and literally overnight into IT, right? Yeah. But again, when I, uh, you know, when you come in from an application point of view and the applicability point of view and that option point of view, I feel it becomes simpler. I'm, I'm not talking about the engineers, but people who are going to actually use blockchain. So there are several use case scenarios. Get familiar with that. I just wanted to add one more complex one, which many of many industries uh, find it complex, is when you look at supply chain, 
the other day I was talking to a client who was, uh, he, they've got about 200 factories manufacturing plants across the globe and they have about 50,000 supply chain vendors, suppliers uh, between their second year and third year. You can imagine that there is no visibility. There is literally no transparency. And the way things are happening today is only through email and, you know, fax and courier, et cetera. There is no one platform that can bring together different people and have this visibility of where what is at any given point in time with the, you know, with an authentic uh, uh, stamp, time stamp of an event that has happened. So these, these are all the beautiful advantages of blockchain so get into the use cases and start adopting it in any small way you can you know uh, check the validity of blockchain in your organization and and then move on and you know grow with it grow the pie through the nodes so um what i would say to that question is um i, I first of all completely agree with everything that's been said up to this point um, I want to give a little bit of a take from a younger person's perspective, having um, like just uh, like four or five years ago uh, left university. I know we have a lot of university students in the audience. So a really fantastic way to get involved in the blockchain ecosystem is to work on startups. And regardless of what your background is, I can tell you that there are probably blockchain startups out there looking for people like you. Um, and I'll give a specific shout out to anyone who is um, in design, um, user experience. Um, there is an absolute, absolute lack of that, um, especially on the um, more like public um, blockchain application type side of things. Um, there is a surplus of developers who can talk to you all day about their, you know, fantastic, innovative solution that is actually awesome, but they can't communicate exactly what that means to their audience, or they're not the greatest with building communities from scratch. Um, so if that's something that comes naturally to you, please look out there because there are people that need you right now. Um, Yeah, just to add to that, uh, actually, I think that in this sort of yeah, blockchain world, all uh, open-minded, all-rounder people who are actually willing or can adapt to change, willing to you know roll up their sleeves and learn new things, they will succeed. So it's again, there are so many things coming together. So you cannot really be a specialist anymore. You, it's it's actually more advantageous if you are an open-minded generalist. So. Completely agree with that. Any other skills that the folks in the audience should be looking towards to participate? Um, I, you know, I agree. I agree with all all that. I do think that you know diversity, specifically diversity uh, from a gender, from a regional, from just you know um, race is an important thing as we consider building these, you know, these future global economy, because we are all towards working towards the same goal. Um, and I think that the more we talk about it, the more we say that we need to look at diversity in engineering teams, that we look at, you know, diversity in, in you know, in marketing and in design, um, in policy, in, in standards, you know, in, in some of the standards works, you find, you know, that diversity is sometimes not uh, a key initiative there, um, is an important piece of what we need to uh, focus on as well. Okay, any, um, any other comments around kind of what the, from a technology perspective um, in your role and what you're bringing to the market, um, if you could, you know, fast forward, you know, five years from now um, and, you know, you're in a hiring frenzy. I know many of you are, are currently in a hiring frenzy as well. Um, what would, what would we, what should people look towards, you know, what kind of education should they get to um, that would help you hire those folks? So I, I start again or quick, Kristen, you go first. Yeah, Alex, you can go. <laughs> yep. I could go then, Alex. Um, so I would say right now, um, when it comes to blockchain knowledge, 
Like if you have any knowledge at all, you're already above the curve. Um, there are a lot of people out there that have a very surface level understanding of blockchain technology. If you can um, show to an employer um, in the blockchain space that you are one, willing to learn, um, and to have a little bit greater than a very basic understanding of blockchain technology, um, I think that that's sufficient for today, uh, getting a job in the space. Five, five years from now, um, we've already seen so, so, so many universities um, building blockchain programs, um, incubators even. So I do think the barrier to entry will be a little bit higher. You're gonna have to dedicate a little bit more time um, to building up skills in the blockchain space through perhaps participating in one of these educational programs um, or an internship at a blockchain company or volunteering at a standards body um, like IEEE. Um, but I guess what I would say is, regardless of what point in time we're talking about, uh, whether it's right now or five years from now, I would recommend just getting started. Uh, whether that means um, volunteering um, with um, some sort of nonprofit in the blockchain space, or starting a course on Coursera, on blockchain, uh, just anything that you can do to get started. That's what I would recommend. And, and Daniela, it's uh, again, you know, more than the diversity part of it, whether it's uh, diversity in terms of region or whatever it is, uh, I think an added element is compassion today. I think uh, that's really missing. So like I started off this conversation by saying that I strongly believe that blockchain is more a philosophy than technology. We are talking of being authentic. We are talking about being transparent as much as possible. You know, have visibility of what you're doing. We're talking of immutability of, of what we do in, uh, in terms of records and things like that. So it's really a philosophy of life and it's uh, really, uh, I apply that to beyond technology, apply that, extend that to business, extend that to the way you live your life. And, mm -hmm. That's missing some things. So, yeah. but there's, a, there's a question actually in the, in the Q&A about, you know, do you, do you think there's a lack of women, so speaking specific, specifically on the gender, do you think there's a lack of women, male majority in the blockchain space because of the space and the community itself, meaning they don't allow support women? Or is it something, you know, societal that this is just, you know, it's technology and it's the same across the, across the world, across the board, whether it's blockchain or, you know, artificial intelligence or something else? Any. Look, not for me. I'm a female founder and 44% of our leadership team um, and, uh, are from very diverse both gender and um, cultural backgrounds. So it's not necessarily a minority in, in the world that I live. Mm -hmm. um, but I will, what, what I do think is interesting is it's often pegged back into STEM. So, you know, science and technology and maths. But um, being the chief entrepreneur in Australia for the last few years, I've been championing esteem with putting an E at the front of it because it's the entrepreneurial spirit and the ability to vision an entirely new way upon which technologies can be used. And not just about innovation, but the entrepreneurship element enables us to be able to make it breathe in the world and give it life, uh, build businesses around that idea. Um, and so I think that's probably the piece that is, is missing. How do we bring entrepreneurship closer to, um, you know, the hardcore skill sets of what's required? But the fundamentals of technology, business and economics is changing and um, you know blockchain just happens to be a bit of a blunt instrument to enable that change to um, begin to, to, to show to show some promise but unless you're able to approach an industry with the alignment of value and value creation then blockchain itself will not help to solve for any one thing provenance or uh, or provide any one stream of value. So uh, I would say the one skill set that everyone needs to bring to the table is, is become a team player. Um, and how do you enact that in a way um, that still provides for economic value, but um, bring participants to the table where the alignment of that value and values is completely joined um, at the hip. And that is the North Star that you're working towards. Yeah, I think um, from, from my point of view, um, totally with everything that has been shared so far, uh, I would add also that there is a, a, an element of personal 
personal push. Um, I hate when they say, oh, you should be more pushy or you should be more, more bold, but I, it is kind of true as well. Um, and, I, and I see this because in general, when you come, especially for technical roles as a woman, there is never a natural benefit of the doubt that is granted to you that you know technical stuff. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but, it, but there is always a degree of, um, of questioning and for you to be able to, um, to showcase in something that shouldn't be there, but unfortunately is what it is. So I, I've, I've gone past, maybe because I'm, I'm past the 40, 40 mark, but I've, I'm past the, the idea of um, not being bold enough to just assert your skills and, and your competence very very explicitly and i think it's fine especially if you're new to the industry and, and you want to get there and you want to get the job um that is uh, of you know in blockchain as a whole so ne never never um underplay or be shy saying oh i think i might do this or i might be able to do it no you, you have to be very explicit um i feel that's something that uh, sometimes um Sometimes it's not given for granted and you know, it's a personal responsibility to do it. And then equally as a recruiter, and by the way, Chinstack is in the hiring frenzy that Barbara is mentioning. So we are, we are recruiting for engineers and also for interns on the business side. So just get in touch on LinkedIn if it's something that, that fly, fly on your side. But also from a recruiting point of view, I think as women, we have to be extremely bold in highlighting that. The, I, I am past the, the being, you know, um, tiptoeing around and being politically correct and know that you just go and if you see that the process is not equal and it's not fair and that that could be with investors as well as it is for recruitment, it's, it's the same thing. As an angel investor myself and as an advisor, I've seen that over and over again. So just be, be a champion, right, on, on our side, but everyone can play their role individually. Be a leader. I mean, the last two companies I was at had CEOs um, who were female. Uh, their CEOs, their chief operating officers, their chief product officers were female. So it was just natural to me. Like I never even thought, you know, like it would just be natural. But I think that, you know, the more people see that as just the reality and, you know, and, you know, that it's possible, it makes it much easier as well. Um, so, um, so thank you, Leanne, for, for leading the way as well for, for many of these um, youngers, young folks. Um, there's a couple of questions on the chat, you know, primarily about, you know, how do you get involved in, in blockchain, right? And I can certainly talk about, you know, the Linux Foundation um, has a lot of education opportunities. We have courses that are free for people to understand how to work in open source and then to learn the basics of blockchain, to learn different um, different um, DLT technologies, et cetera. But maybe share some of your ideas or things that you've recommended to others who come to you. Um, in the past, we used to have those people come to us in person, right? We were at events or we were having a cocktail somewhere and people would be like, how do I get into blockchain? Um, some suggestions of, of people, of where people should go. Um, Scylla, do you have some idea, some ideas of where, where people should go to? Yeah, I mean, I think, as you said, uh, sort of joining uh, open source communities, that's definitely something that, uh, you know, anyone could do and, and, and uh, you know, be introduced because now, especially now with open source communities, again, it's not technical anymore. In open source communities, there are a lot of different backgrounds working together on different projects, right? So that's a really good way to start, you know, getting familiar with blockchain and, you know, evolve, um, get smarter about it and meet people and so on. And then also, as, you know, as, as um, the fellow panelists mentioned, internships at companies, even, you know, at a startup, I mean, for example, now we, we, we do have uh, three interns working on a very specific project and that, and I think that's that's a fantastic way to to you know learn about the business learn about the technology itself the business and actually work on a specific project right so you, you already you know even you spend a few months and then you create something and then you can use that you know to move to, to be able to move forward from that absolutely um and I would actually like to give a, a really fantastic example for how someone um, that I know recently got into the industry, he had an internship with um, our IEEE working group 
three month long internship. And what he did is he posted on Medium um, what he learned uh, every month of the internship. And based on that, he ended up getting a paid job. They reached out to him and they were like, wow, we really, really like your articles would you be able to write articles for us? And he, as a like second year student in college was like, yeah, totally. And since then he's been super into the blockchain community and, and growing every day. Um, but I guess that's just a testament to show you like, once you get your foot, like once you like dip your toe into the blockchain ecosystem, there's just so much opportunity abound. Um, and, you could do that through internships, but you know, e even if that seems a little bit too much for you, I, I would just recommend reaching out to people that you know um, in the industry or a professor um, at your university that is into blockchain and just have a conversation and just be like, hey, I'm thinking about trying to get involved in this. Do you have any ideas? Can you introduce me to anyone? Because um, at, le at least for me, one of the things that I found most valuable is just asking people if they were willing to grab digital coffee with me and um, and chatting and hearing what they have to say about the industry, hearing their stories, and then eventually getting more actively involved. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And again, uh, coming back to the adoption part is that the more customers adopt this and uh, there is more acceptance of blockchain in your in your organizations, be it enterprise or small and medium or banks or whatever, you know, you're going to have more of these uh, students sort of grow up in life with blockchain. As otherwise, it's going to continue to remain a wow thing, uh, something great to, from a learning perspective, from an academy, academia point of view, but not necessarily from a, you know, usability point of view. So I would really encourage more and more clients and customers and prospects and people to start using <laughs> blockchain get onto it get onto the platform there will be certain uh, uh, challenges initially if you feel i mean get that all ironed out with whoever you're working with uh, but get on to the journey of blockchain don't uh, delay that it's, it's my advice because if you don't adopt it then what are the engineers going to you know sort of do so mm -hmm. the demand for this will become more when people start adopting it yeah. And I think you just, you need, yeah, you need to get into it. I mean, uh, you know, my, my first experience with blockchain was um, I walked into a Bitcoin um, meetup in like 20, 2014, 20, no, 2013. Um, and it was a bunch of bros, <laughs> young men in San Francisco. And they all looked at me and I, I'm not, I wasn't young back then. I'm not young now. They all looked at me and they were like, what are you doing here? <laughs> Pretty much. Um, and I think I mentioned to somebody, oh, I work at Dow Jones. And they were like, please go away. Um, but I went back. And I went back and I went to others and I found other communities that were working on the technology. And I said, I need to learn this. I, this is the future financial industry. This is what, what's going to happen. And I just you know, kept going at it. Um, and obviously I had you know, 15 years of working in financial services with Dow Jones. So I felt the confidence and I had you know, women telling technologists telling me that it's okay to get in there. So I think that's an important part. I'm gonna go over to the questions. Uh, some, there's some interesting questions. Uh, one uh, from Duncan uh, Johnson Swat about uh, how important is something like the recently announced ASEAN blockchain consortium in terms of raising awareness across the region? Is anybody aware of, of that work and kind of if you're participating? I guess you could consider Australia a part of ASEAN, but we're not really hearing about it down here, so we don't know mm -hmm. too much about it. But there, there's other, you know, national uh, consortiums that maybe you're participating in um, that are, you know, experimenting, you know, building these. Yeah, so Australian government, uh, we, we published the Australian National Blockchain Roadmap Strategy. Um, so there's definitely consortiums in each of the countries that are largely being led in various forms, but there's also grassroots movements with either startups or, um, you know, as you mentioned, you know, meetup groups. Uh, and I think that they're probably um, 
they, they probably have more hands on the steering wheel in those types of environments where people are actually using the technology. You often find sometimes um, sort of the higher banded, um, you know, consortiums for want of a bad term uh, are theorising about where the possibility of the technology lies rather than the practicalities of what is currently at hand. They're not building. <laughs> I would say Hyperledger, India chapter is doing a great job, Daniela. We see a lot of, <laughs> uh, you know, posts and right. well, but, well, yeah, you know, but it, it's, yeah, it's kind of different, right? Because it's an open source community. So all are yeah. welcome to participate. There's real, you know, there's real coding, there's real work happening. There's real contributions sure. to the projects that then are being used in these consortiums, right? is an important element of it as well. Um, but yeah, I agree, you know, the Hyperledger India uh, regional chapter has been, you know, fantastic in building a community of, you know, thousands and thousands of developers at all levels um, that are getting involved uh, specifically with Hyperledger. But I think, you know, when you, when you whether you're learning, you know, uh, a, a public blockchain, you know, protocol or a Hyperledger protocol, you're basically contributing to the development of these technologies and the use cases as well. So um, thank you for, for mentioning that as well. And it's on, on my list of things to do. Um, let's see here. Blockchain, let me see. Uh, blockchain is, a, is transformative. This is a question from Anna, Rebecca. Blockchain is transformative to say the least. What's each of the panelists' dream, vision, purpose for humanity through the work that they've been doing or businesses that they use this philosophy technology? So, um, you know, what what is it that you know your goals, your dreams in building using uh, DLT and blockchain technologies? Yeah, so uh, I can go first. So one is of course from the adoption from the business point of view, but other than that, in the government uh, arena, as uh, Leanne also mentioned, we we need to do that. In India, they are adopting quite a bit, even in, uh, you know, whether it's birth certificates, death certificates kind of thing, land registration, these are some important areas where we are seeing, and it would be great to see uh, more and more adoption in that. In the not-for-profit uh, space as well, for example, in large, uh, there's a lot of CSR funding that comes uh, to NGOs and not-for-profits and how the money is being utilized into what project having a clear visibility of that is a great uh, use case again, not necessarily in the business, but in the not-for-profit world. So ideally I would like uh, to see this uh, spread across the, uh, you know, industries, across uh, use cases. So it, not just in the private sector, but also in the public sector and in the not-for-profit sector. And, uh, let, let, let me go second. <laughs> On the, uh, and I'm going to pick up on the on the scalability side because I think we are we are just touching the, the very beginning of a long journey. It's like a, it's going to be like a ten years at least journey because we see a bit of more maturity and scalability from the point of view of infrastructure um, on the Web three. It's fascinating to see and but I think even more so is the scalability of governance that blockchain is is uh, is challenging. So from an enterprise point of view, of course, it's the embedding and the breaking from a competitive model to a collaborative model. That's for sure something that, you know, it's already changing, it's already happening. But my personal personal fascination on the Web3 with the DAO prospects, and you see, for example, projects like Polkadot, that are really pushing the boundaries and, and see what can be achieved when a community is self-governing itself. To an extent, you've seen this already as a great example with Hyperledger as an open source community, but when it comes also to managing funds and treasury, that becomes extremely extremely, extremely, you know, uh, interesting. And personally, I want to see this, you know, to full fruition and see if that is actually going to be a lever field. And at the beginning, there was all, you know, all messaging seems to be like in tune in the blockchain industry. It's always all about democratizing something, right? It's still there, but I, I want to see it in action, right? I want to see that the governance has actually, you know, bypassed what are the barriers for equal access to many services and products for people. And I think only only DAO governance, you know, can can actually take us there. Maybe it's a bit of an extreme, but it's very personal. So don't don't say that chain stack is sharing this vision as society. It's probably more of a personal one. But for sure, for sure, it's something that I want to see. And I think the other thing that that I really want to see is um, 
um, as the governance comes and as the technology matures, we are going to see more multidimensional relationships between businesses. So the matrix is going to become more complex. And that's something that we, we, we can facilitate with the technology. So it's good to see it and code it and actualize in a, in a safe way. Yeah, um, so what, what, I know what I find especially fascinating is that uh, we are, I think, now seeing that the least digitized industries are taking on DLT and are doing really great things with it. And, you know, for example, if we think about commodity training, uh, uh, trade, training, sorry, <laughs> trading, <laughs> for example, with, you know, there are some initiatives like uh, Gray Chain, uh, one example, where actually they have taken DLT and it, they join its forces with, you know, other emerging technology as IoT and AI and what, you know, the whole uh, goal was to do supply uh, chain resilience, sustainability, fair trade and things like that. And, and I think in, in these sort of markets where, you know, traditionally price was sort of the, the, the only differentiator, when you apply these technologies, you, you not only increase the, uh, the production efficiency, but also cre you create opportunity for additional differentiation for, you know, in this case for farmers, right? Such as fair trade, it's, uh, you can talk about social inclusion and environmental compliance and things like that. So I think this is actually a, a really fascinating thing. And I, I hope to see more of these initiatives uh, coming along. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm a big fan of Grand Chain also, by the way, everyone in the audience, definitely look it up. Awesome project, great team. Um, so actually my, my thing um, that, that stands out as something that I am hopeful to see in the future um, continue is blockchain's ability to remove middlemen. Um, if we have any middlemen in the audience, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, you, know, you know, for so long across so many industries, there have been players that extract value um, as opposed to add value. Um, in the case of Grain Chain, um, there are a bunch of middlemen out there that uh, reap a lot of the profits that don't end up going to farmers. Um, whereas with Grain Chain's blockchain platform, um, they're allowing farmers to uh, reap a, a lot more profits and a lot shorter um, payment time span. And you know that's absolutely the case across so many different applications of blockchain technology. So I would say from a humanitarian standpoint, like I completely agree with everyone else's answers. Like there's so much to be looking forward uh, to in the blockchain space, but, but I would say from the humanitarian standpoint, it's gonna improve a lot of lives. It's gonna improve a lot of lives. And is, it, is it always gonna be called blockchain, <laughs> right? Do, do the, does the farmer really care? is the question like the, you know oh no uh, <laughs> and, and, and maybe land you have you know experience with this within the diamond industry right from a retail perspective um you know tell us a little bit about you know what does the consumer care about um well consumer cares about trust and transparency and you know uh, the question about uh, where does the future sort of hold value? We had a great project in 2016 with Tanzania and 50 mining women um, uh, in the colour gemstone space where the collective value that was created um, where we managed to bring the trade out of Tanzania directly up into the luxury brands enabled us now to commit to generation over generation of um, gemological education. So now women who were miners who typically had a shovel and were digging dirt who looked at the colour green um, now understands the, the value of each of those shades of green. Uh, and so that's a committed project now that will, will run across um, generations to come and has come together uh, with many people in industry. And Everledger led that work out in 2016 and now it's become the new way upon which um, the world, the world operates or our industry operates with artisanal small-scale mining communities. Consumers don't really look towards blockchain right now. I mean, they're just looking for signals of trust and transparency, um, but they are willing to pay more if you are um, able to bring that truth to the forefront of what, what I call sort of conscious consumerism. I don't think we'll be talking about blockchain in five or 10 years time. I just like, we're not talking about HTTP or SMTP, you know, the protocols that gave birth to um, 
an application called email or an application called the browser. And I think once we've transformed with the W3C and a lot of the work that's happening at that protocol level, then hopefully this will just be the way upon which we trade. And it is just simply the new versioning of the tools of the internet. So that's what I'm hopeful for. Kirsten, thanks for bringing up this uh, thing on um, farmers. And uh, so we are already doing that actually in India to some extent. So there is an app where uh, the farmers can actually buy, sell using the app, but not just that part, not just the farmer part of it, but right from the farm to fork uh, part of uh, the value chain. So blockchain is definitely hugely uh, useful in that. Going back to Leanne's point on the transparency and the visibility part, mm -hmm. trust part, yeah. That will definitely help. Um, yes. Does anybody else have anything to add on that? Just one small point on, it's not a small, but uh, the, um, I think increasingly maybe the public will start to ask questions about the sustainability from an environmental point of view of the technology. And I think questions are started to be asked. So I think we're, as, as an industry, even though we're just starting, but we have to look at the long-term trajectory of the technology and you know, bake in whatever are these you know, requirements. It cannot be proof of work and you know, endless use of, of resources. So as, a, as an industry, I think, you know, the consumer will ask that sometimes so as, as much as also data, data privacy and data ownership attached to the use of blockchain for use cases. Yep, absolutely. Anybody have any comments on the climate? Um, and energy consumption discussion. I mean, certainly, you know, the, it, it might not be happening within the hyperledger, the permissioned blockchain world, but it certainly um, touches upon us as well. It's an undeniable topic that we have to solve for. So, and we can't wait till 2025 to do it. So, best we put our energies towards it. Yep, exactly. Um, certainly, yeah, um, you know, reaching out here at Hyperledger, we've been doing a lot of work with our climate action special interest group and reaching out to other groups in the community and universities and um, people who've been working on climate related um, technologies for a long time to bring them in to, to have their subject matter expertise, have them come in and kind of teach us the things that we should be looking for and which partners, right? This is something that is going to be um, a requirement that the governments are gonna to have to get together, that you know, the consumers are gonna to have to get together. Everybody's gonna to have to get together and work um, on these issues if we're gonna make any progress you know, before 2025 um, as needed as well. Um, there was a question before around interoperability, and I think, Alex, you brought up interoperability before. Um, it says interoperability is the largest issue for the organizations to work with each other. Um, could anyone elaborate on how various blockchains are solving this? So how the problems of interoperability um, between, you know, between networks, um, et cetera? So just as a, as a quick answer, of course, you can look at interoperability at protocol level, or you can look at how different blockchains can talk to each other, you know, at infrastructure level or at application level. So there is no one solution, I think, that will that will that will come. But I've seen a lot of movement, for example, on getting what, what they call wrappings. So you will have one protocol, maybe it's a permission protocol, uh, wrapped into a public like Ethereum that will allow for you know an expansion of usability and tokenization of it. So for example, like a Corda plus Ethereum, that seems to be something that people are gravitating towards. Or in other ways where you have, um, I mean, it can be even simpler than that, where you will have one use case that requires different vertical solutions that are best uh, resolved by different blockchains. So you will have a portfolio of blockchains. And in that sense, you will need some tools that will allow you to manage it in a way that is sustainable for you know, not just a very big enterprise, but also for, for smaller players. And, you know, that, that will come also, you know, we, we touched very early on also with Raji with the discussing the idea of having, you know, good infrastructure and good tools, same with Chilla and so on. So I think those are the two things. Interoperability is the, it's the, uh, the unicorn. Everyone is chasing to find that, but we're not, not there yet. But people, many, many people, very clever, clever people are trying to solve it in different ways. Great. 
Any other comments on Raji? No, absolutely. I had mentioned that in the beginning, saying that interoperability is going to be key. And uh, also because here we are trying to connect different digital islands, which has never been the case before. Earlier, all the software uh, solutions that you had was to improve efficiency and whatever within the organization, be it an ERP or a payroll or whatever. Whereas this is going to be one of those, uh, especially the private uh, secure networks, uh, where it's going to bring in different uh, digital islands to have that visibility. So interoperability is going to be absolutely key. Uh, there was one question I noticed in the audience, which is about how do you choose an appropriate business model for a particular blockchain use case? Uh, there's somebody from me here, I think. Mm -hmm. So Daniela, if you're okay, I can take that question. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah. Yeah, so this is something that we'll have to sit and uh, I can take it actually offline with you. Uh, that's from Anjali. Uh, I'm happy to have the discussion with you. Uh, this, what kind of business model will depend obviously on what kind of use case and what kind of use case would be appropriate to your business is where we really sit together and have that discussion because not one uh, thing fits all, right? Uh, so this is something that will need to be defined and crafted uh, and we pay attention to that. Uh, we don't want to do a generic one. So happy to have the conversation offline. Great. There's a, another question. Oh, go ahead, Kirsten. Did you have to? Yeah, yeah I was actually going to say um, in regards to interoperability, um, a very interesting angle to the interoperability discussion is interoperability of governance um, in between blockchain ecosystems. And we actually have a wonderful um, fellow woman in blockchain on our team at IEEE P2145, um, Denise McCurdy, who's doing a bunch of research in this space. Definitely look into her work. Um, but um, the way that I would like to, I guess, analogize uh, the governance uh, or the, the meta governance between blockchain ecosystems is looking at geopolitics. So there's gonna be times where you have um, joint decision-making between two blockchain ecosystems. Um, there are already um, the beginnings of um, governance bodies that reside higher than the actual ecosystem level. Um, but it's just gonna be a really interesting um, thing to observe as blockchain matures, how the governance of various systems, it will interact with each other. There's another question for you, Kirsten, on the IEEE standard. So for the IEEE standard, is there any work plan for the lower layers, uh, e.g. the consensus protocol besides governance? Are there any requirements on privacy aspects and environmental impacts? Oh yeah, most certainly. So um, there are actually um, dozens of working groups within the IEEE right now that are dealing with blockchain technology across um, all sorts of areas. Um, Specifically privacy, I know that there is at least one working group that is dealing with privacy right now. I'm not sure of their progress, but I'd be more than happy to put you in contact with them. Um, I'll plot my email in the chat if you wanna just shoot me an email regarding that. But long story short, tons of opportunities to contribute regardless of what your specialty is. Um, there are even um, like vertical specific um, working groups. So if you're like specifically Fascinating with fascinated with like supply chain and blockchain. There are groups dealing with that under the IEEE or IoT and blockchain. The list goes on. Great. Um, there's one more question, and then we'll go to the final uh, panel. And I, I see that Leanne had to drop off. Um, so the question is, where do you see the industry moving with? Uh, our favorite word of the month. Oh no, it's a new month. Maybe it's not this one of this month. NFTs, non-functional tokens. So anybody have any thoughts or ideas around where you see the industry moving uh, in regards to NFTs? Yeah, so, so I, I think again, it taps onto the irreverence of the industry. That's it's kind of uh, misunderstood, like the applicability of NFTs actually and the usability is, is going to, to grow. <laughs> like, there are serious applications, but of course it, it, it gains, pro, you know, the, the news are never covering boring, you know, if, you know bo business topics. They're always trying to find something sensational and crazy. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can get like a, 
you know, the, the 69 million uh, NFT covered and then everyone has a craze for some pixels putting in random order onto an image and getting, you know, a lot of money. And because of that, um, it becomes something crazy. But uh, in, in reality, I think I will see a lot of applications in certifications use cases. You will see a lot of portability, for example, of certifications of education. Um, there is a lot of that uh, can be done in that sense. And I think also a lot of use cases um, on uh, many uh, uh, artistic uh, fields, for sure. There is the media entertainment SIG at, at the Hyperledger that is looking very closely at uh, you know, wider applications. And that can bring, you know, we were discussing earlier, and then also this idea of the sustainability and circular economy, right? That if you're bringing this into the, also the, the blockchain as an industry, you know, and becoming more secular, then you're gonna bring, you know, new revenue models for, for artists as a whole and new ways for them to monetize their work that, are not, that were not there before. So I think there is plenty, Adila, you know, leave alone the sensationalism and a bit of the crazy, <laughs> crazy, you know, headlines. The technology is very solid. Uh, you will see more, more of it coming. Yeah, and uh, and thank you for mentioning the uh, media entertainment sig. I put the link in the uh, chat as well. So that was one of our newest special interest groups focused. And you know they 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 you know they've been having some presentations by Verizon, which is a big tele uh, telecom company, around the transparency, their media transparency initiatives. Um, there is uh, Panini, which is a, a, a hundred and eighteen year old company that is has been doing trading cards and other sports paraphernalia, you know, that people collect, collect collectibles, I guess they're called. Um, and uh, two years ago, they used Hyperledger Sawtooth to build an NFT platform. Um, so, you know, it, it's not new. People have been working on this for a while. There's very interesting use cases happening in Hyperledger as well as outside of Hyperledger in the public uh, spell as well. Um, we actually have, uh, we're going to have a, one of the, our conference that's coming up, Hyperledger Global Forum, uh, which is a conference that is happening in the middle of June, June 8th through the 10th. It's going to have two seg segments, one for Europe, North America, and one for Asia and Europe. So you can attend sessions at any time and we'll have uh, one of, the, uh, there's a couple of talks on NFTs um, and there's going to be a keynote as well, um, as well as keynotes and talks on interoperability, on, you know, how to get involved in open open source communities, what, what training and opportunities are there. So it is, I'm going to plug the Hyperledger Global Forum, which is um, on uh, June 8th through the 10th, um, a virtual this year as well. Um, so I have one more, uh, one more question as we say goodbye to everybody. And let me see if I can share this with you. So, you know, we were kind of talking about a little bit about what our what our, you know, what our career paths are, or where people should go in to get involved with blockchain. So um, that's me. I'm about two years old, maybe two, yeah, two years old. Um, and you know, what advice would you give to your younger self? You know, looking at yourself. You know, obviously not a two because we don't understand that <laughs> as well. But um, what would be the advice that you would like to tell yourself um, about how to get into blockchain? Uh, let's see, Alex, you want to start? We'll go alphabetical. Sure. So first I would say find, find uh, allies and ask for what you need explicitly. Don't be shy, just go straight. And, you know, personally, if you're in the audience and you want to get into blockchain, feel free to, you know, connect on LinkedIn and drop me a line. Always happy to mentor and to find, um, you know, new opportunities for new people on the, in the industry. If the industry is growing, it means that new people need to come in. And if people don't know about blockchain, that's a good opportunity to get to learn about blockchain. So not knowing about blockchain is very normal. And also as an industry, we are figuring it out. We also don't know, we're still experimenting. So it's all good. So come, come in and, and join us. And by the way, I can see our questions about career opportunities in organization. I reiterate, Chinsak is hiring for engineering roles and for interns in marketing. So definitely. And the second advice, second last advice to my younger self in blockchain. <laughs> so um, just consistency is really overrated. Don't, don't be shy and don't be, don't think that because you started a career in something that you cannot pivot. Um, I think you, you are, everyone is a symphony of selves, right? We're not just one monolithic person. So nurture all of them and just go in and be you know, quite bold and fearless about it. 
Uh, I can go next. Yeah, go ahead, Ron. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, that's a cute picture. <laughs> Daniela, <laughs> Thank you. So and taking a cue from what Alex mentioned. So nurturing, she mentioned. So yes, nurturing and compassion is strong to us, strong to women. So if I look back, I would say go with that strength. And that's our strength. That's not a weakness. So go with that. Every business, every organization, every team needs that, needs that compassion, needs that nurturing. Feel more confident to bring in that balance in the organization that uh, you're going to be working. So, yeah, that's it. What I would tell Thank you. my... What I would tell my younger self is get started today. Um, even if you aren't positive that you want to be in this industry, sample, uh, start contributing in some fashion, reach out to one of us, anything that you can do, just get started. Get started. <laughs> Jump in. <laughs> That's really good advice. And uh, actually, I would rather like directing the advice to my younger self, I would like to direct it to all those people who are starting their professional careers. And, uh, you know, just um, don't be arrogant, but be bold and uh, don't be afraid of getting out of your comfort zone and making mistakes. That's fine. You can learn a lot in those type of situations. Be curious and don't stick to one thing. Uh, especially as you've seen, I mean, blockchain brings um, together so many th different things, right? And in my experience, it's better to be great at a number of things that, you know, trying to be the best at one, only one thing. And uh, maybe for something for life that also, you know, strive for balance in your life. It's not everything is not about work. And uh, in my case, for example, sports has been and continue to be a key part of my life. I, could, I couldn't survive without sports. <laughs> so. <laughs> What sports are you into? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, beach volleyball, CrossFit, Taekwondo. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I know we're at the, at the, at the, at the time. Um, I want to thank all the panelists uh, for putting this together. I want to thank the organizers of the Hyperledger India Regional Chapter and St. Gitz for putting the panel together, for offering you know, these opportunities for our communities to talk together um, and hopefully to be able to learn from one another. Um, I think hopefully what we came out of it today is that we're all very bullish on the technology, but also very cognizant that it is about people. It's about people and the humans and the, the goals that we want for a future, um, a future financial economy, uh, a future climate, um, a future for our children is really important. So um, thank you, Alex, Chilla, Kirsten, Raji, and to Leanne who had to leave. Um, for joining us. And once again, thank you to the India Regional Chapter and to the St. Gitts team. Um, you all are fabulous. Um, and, you know, stay safe, uh, be good to one another, and we'll see you soon.